Grace and peace to you. Welcome to this time of online worship with St. Paul's Church of the Nazarene. Let us prepare our hearts for worship this morning by hearing from the word of the Lord from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted, you ancient doors, that the King of glory might come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. And this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Let us begin our time together by singing praises to the Lord. Blessed be your name.
worship this morning comes from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner in my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me, and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation to your presence this morning. Would you give us hearts that are able to seek you, to hear from you, and to see you. We pray that you might make us open to the things that you are doing in and through us this day. We pray all of this in your son's holy name. Amen. And friends, would you receive this blessing? May the peace of Christ be with you. Let's continue worshiping the Lord in song by singing, We Will Glorify. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah.
morning comes from Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 through 28. Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 through 28. Hear the word of the Lord. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The cross has the final word. Let us sing this morning. The cross has the As we continue in this time of worship, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we are thankful for the many ways that you are present at, and at work in our lives, in our communities, and in our world. We, uh, we know that there's a lot of concerns that are happening right now. Uh, concerns that are personal, uh, concerns that impact uh, our communities, our families, and concerns again that impact the world. And Lord, we ask uh, that you would help us to have a, a kind of perspective that you see, a, a perspective that is bigger than just this moment, that in the moments of difficulty where our eyes begin to become so, so focused on what's happening to us, we lose sight of of the larger picture of what you're doing. We lose sight of the larger vision of your your kingdom and your rule, and we begin to uh, become fearful kinds of people. So we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be captivated by a new kind of hope that only co comes from you, 
uh, the kind of hope that uh, leans into resurrection life, uh, the kind of hope that does not see death as the final say-so, but, but begins to see that as the means by which you work, uh, that where things come to an end, uh, even there you can bring about new beginnings. So Lord, we ask that you would just continue to work on our hearts, not to be fearful and frightened, not to be angry and resentful, but to be people that are hopeful and that continue to move forward, uh, living into the life you've called us to live into, the life that resembles the Beatitudes, a life that resembles the life of Christ. We lift up those who are mourning this day, who continue to grieve. Uh, we lift up those who are hurting and isolated. We lift up those who have been sick and impacted by not only the pandemic, but other, other kinds of ailments. We lift them up to you today. Uh, we lift up Richard and Sharon, ask Lord that you'd continue to work in them and be with them, be present. We lift up the Spalding family and Lord again, be present with them as they continue to mourn and grieve. But even in the midst of grief, Father, we also find things that we can be thankful for. We're thankful for our church family. We're thankful for uh, our families that are close by and, and uh, that we have the opportunity to engage with. We're thankful for friends and, and we're thankful for the ways that you have provided for us. Help us to be a community that continues to look out uh, beyond ourselves and to see those around us that, that need to be blessed, that need encouragement friendship, who, who need food and shelter, and may we be the kinds of people that uh, help them, that offer good news, uh, even into the most desperate places. May our, our mourning turn into joy, and may our joy be shared with all. We ask that you would be with Pastor Becca as she proclaims your word this day, and, and that it would be words that give us strength. Uh, for each new moment, that we would hear your voice in her words, and so that they become your words and their life-giving to us and to our community. Help us to be faithful to that call, and, and to, again, be reassured of the hope that is in the gospel, in li li living into the life of Christ. Uh, may we be encouraged this day and uh, challenged uh, as we hear your voice together. And now we pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen, and amen. Well, it has been a wonderful time of worship this far and we are looking forward to hearing a word from the lord this morning we are going to be continuing in our sermon series on the beatitudes uh, from matthew chapter 5. today's beatitude is going to come from matthew chapter 5 verse 8. matthew chapter 5 verse 8 and god's word reads blessed are the pure in heart for they will see god and this is the word of the lord thanks be to god let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much that you are a God who gathers your people, that you call us by name, that you meet us for this time of worship wherever we might find ourselves worshiping from this morning. We ask now that you would speak to us through your words. I ask that it would not merely be my words that we hear, but that it would be your words for your people. Give us open hearts and minds and ears to hear and receive the word that you have for us, that we might leave this place changed and transformed more and more into the holy image of Christ Jesus, our Lord. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. One of my kids' least favorite things to do is to clean their room. I mean, it is an everyday kind of struggle in our household. They know the routine. It's not a secret. They can play with whatever toys they want to throughout the day with the caveat that they have to put them all back where they belong before they go to bed. 
It's nothing new, the same rules day in and day out. And yet every day, about 7 p.m., when that time rolls around for them to start getting ready for bed and to be picking up their room, it is received like unexpected breaking news. You would think every single day that we are telling them something that they have never heard before by the surprised and shocked looks on their little faces. Now, Hannah has always been our sneaky child. The kind of child where if it gets quiet for very long, you need to immediately put down what you're doing and go see what's up. And one of the ways that she's tried to be sneaky from time to time is in the task of picking up her room. She is notorious for finding ways to sneak her way through it, to cut corners, to keep from actually having to do the hard work. I remember one time when she was about two and a half years old, I had asked her to go and, and to pick up a few of the toys laying on the floor in her room. And she spent a little bit of time doing that and then came and called for me to come and take a look. And so I go into her room and at first glance, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. It looks clean. The toys that had been scattered all over the floor were no longer in sight. By all appearances, it looked like she had done what I had asked. She had done a good job at cleaning her room. But there, in and of itself, began to make uh, me a little suspicious, and I began to take a closer look. And as I did, I noticed that her covers were a little bit ruffled, a little bit higher on the bed than normal. And so I went back and I pulled back those covers, and I discovered all sorts of toys just stuffed under those covers. And then it gets worse. I, I looked down the sides of the bed and saw all sorts of books shoved down between the wall and her bed. Then having a sneaking suspicion that it even got worse from there, I went to the door of her closet and I pulled open the door and it seemed like half of the toys in her room just came crashing out onto the floor. You see, by all appearances, her room was clean. At first glance, it seemed like she had done exactly what I had asked. But in reality, the outward appearance did not tell the whole story. The outside appearance did not reflect faithfully what was going on on the inside. She had tried to make it look good, but had failed to do the hard work of actually cleaning her room. In reality, we aren't so much like Hannah today. And I don't just mean shoving things in a closet or back room when we have unexpected company, because I am certainly guilty of doing that from time to time. But we're also like Hannah in the reality that our outward appearance does not always match what is inside. The outward appearance does not always reveal the inner struggle. The outer persona does not always match the inward reality. You see, we may look good on the outside. We may appear to others like we have it all together. And yet on the inside, we are just praying that no one sees that which we are trying so hard to keep hidden. Praying that no one opens that closet door to see the mess that just might come spilling out. An inconsistency between one's outward appearance and persona and one's inward disposition and attitude has often been a struggle for God's people. For many of the Jews in Jesus' day, like in Hannah's room, there was an inconsistency between what it looked like on the outside and what it actually was on the inside. In fact, this is one of Jesus' primary complaints against the religious leaders of the day, that their outward appearance did not match the attitude of their hearts. The Jewish leaders, in particular the Pharisees, were among those who looked really good on the outside. The outside persona was immaculate. They were the type of people who appeared like they had it together all the time. Those who you would have put up on a spiritual pedestal, the ones you would have esteemed to be like, but wonder if it's even possible because their bar seems to be set so high. From outward appearance, 
It sure seemed like they were the gold standard. They went through all the right motions, demanding a rigid upholding of the law, tediously following all of the necessary purity rituals, watching their hands and their garments, doing everything they could to make the outside of them clean and presentable before God. By appearances, it seemed like they were the type of people who were clean and pure, the kind of people who had it all together, the kind of people who would be found worthy before God. And yet, as we heard in our scripture reading earlier, it was not enough. Though the outward appearance appeared holy and pristine, there was a disconnect between the outward actions and the attitude of their heart. Their actions communicated a holiness before God that was not present within. Their actions communicated a holiness that they did not actually possess. Their actions made them appear righteous, and yet Jesus calls them hypocrites. Here are these people held in the highest of regard who devoted themselves to going through all the right motions, and yet it fell short because their motives and intentions were not pure. They were going through all the right motions, but their hearts were not in it. It looked like they were pursuing the things of God when actually they were pursuing power and security and status. You see, there was a disconnect between the appearance of what people saw on the outside and what was really taking place on the inside. In great contrast to this blessing that we see presented by Jesus in the Beatitudes of the Sermon of the Mount, we see a list of woes given by Jesus to the Pharisees in the scripture that we read earlier from Matthew 23. I invite you to hear those words again. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they are the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. The Pharisees really went through all the right motions. Although they seemed to be a people who had it all together, the type of person you would admire and esteem to be like, it doesn't fool Jesus. <laughs> Who knows that inwardly they were full of greed and self-indulgence, of hypocrisy and wickedness and pride. Now I want to be clear this morning. Jesus is not recommending some sort of inward spirituality. Jesus is not saying that our actions do not matter. He's not suggesting that keeping the law is not a good thing. Rather, he's simply saying that it's not enough. It's not enough enough. All the right actions are not enough. Rigidly keeping the law is not enough. Meeting the purity standards are not enough. Outward appearance is not enough. In today's terms, we might put it this way. Being at church every time the doors are open is not enough. Attending church your whole life is not enough. Being a nice person is not enough. Trying to do the right thing is not enough. Singing songs and giving tithes and praying prayers, these are all good things. These are all things that we should be doing and participating in as the body of Christ, but in and of themselves, these good things are not enough. You see, church, all of the outward actions in the world cannot make us right before God if the inward of attitude of our hearts has not been transformed by God. All of the striving to look like we have it all together, all the keeping up of appearances, all the right going through the motions is not enough. Though we may convince those around us, we do not fool God. As God says in 1 Samuel 16, man looks at outward appearance, but God 
looks at the heart. Through the prophet Joel, in Joel chapter 2, God says, Rend your hearts, not your garments. You see, Jesus was able to see through the facade. Though the Pharisees had convinced others, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that they had also convinced themselves that they were doing the right things, going through the right motions. But Jesus was able to see that something was missing. Jesus was able to see that their lives were failing to bear the good fruit of a transformed heart. Jesus says this in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, it's easy for us to mentally tear down the Pharisees. <laughs> These hypocrites. How could they do that? How could they live this way? How could they go through all of the right motions and yet their hearts not be in it? And yet the reality is, is if the Pharisees were here and alive today, they would most likely be cherished members of our church. They would be those who would be here first every Sunday. They would be Sunday school teachers and board members and pastors. They would be the ones faithfully giving their tithes and making generous offerings to help the ministries of the church. They would be the ones calling us to maintain a high morality and standard of living. They would be those who seem to say all the right things and to have all the right answers. The reality, church, is that this disconnect, this inconsistency between outward actions and the inward disposition is a temptation for every one of us. If we're honest, it's easier to do what Hannah did, to shove down the mess between the bed and the wall, to stuff it in the closet, and to shove the door shut. It's often easier to keep the mess hidden, to put on a good front, to pretend like we have it all together than it is to embrace the humility before God and one another that is necessary for God to do the difficult and sometimes painful work of transforming our hearts. The church is important for us to realize this morning that the stuffing down, the hiding, the pretending, the keeping up of appearances does not make us right before God. It does not make us holy and pure. It does not change or transform our hearts. Only God can do this work of grace. Only God can make pure that which was sinful and unclean. Only God can transform the heart. The psalmist of Psalm 51 says it this way, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Church, it has always been God's desire that all people might live in right relationship with him. That all people might be pure of heart. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a well-known German theologian and pastor from the early, early 20th century, wrote, Who is pure of heart? Only those who have surrendered their hearts completely to Jesus, that he may reign in them alone. Only those whose hearts are undefiled by their own evil and by their own virtues, too. Church, God wants all of us. Not just an outward appearance, not just the outward persona, not just the part of us that we portray to the world, but all of us. God wants to reign as Lord over every part of our lives. God doesn't want merely lip service from us. Rather, God longs for us to be a people who have been truly transformed from the inside out by the love and grace of a holy God. A people whose lives bear the good fruit of justice and mercy and faithfulness in a deeply broken world. A people whose lives reflect the very heart 
of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer later in his book wrote this, they shall see God whose hearts have become a reflection of Christ Jesus. Church, the blessing that Jesus pronounces for those who are pure in heart is a special one, that they will see God. Where sin and brokenness once separated us from God, for the pure in heart, there is this promise of intimate communion with God once again. It's an incredible promise to think about. That one day the pure in heart will see God face to face. As it says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part. Then we shall know fully even as we are fully known. It is incredible to think about. For those who are pure in heart, we will see God face to face one day. A luxury that even Moses was not allowed when he asked to see the glory of God. God had to hide him in the cleft of the rock and he could only catch a glimpse of the glory of God as God passed by. And yet one day the promise is that for the pure of heart, we might see God face to face to face, that one day we might be able to look on the fullness of the glory of God, that one day the sin and brokenness that separated us will be wiped away forever, and we will know God in God's fullness. What a promise, what a blessing for those who are found pure in heart, for those who make space for God to do the transformative work of grace in our lives. Church, God does not simply want part of us. God does not simply want lip service. God does not simply want a people who go through the motions. But God wants us to be pure in heart. A people who are wholly devoted to this way of Jesus. A people who allow ourselves in humility to come before God and allow God to do the work of transformation in our lives that we need to be made right before God once again. <laughs> God desires nothing more than for us to be a people who are in right relationship with him, for sin and brokenness to no longer separate us and God, for us to be able to look on the fullness of God one glorious day. That is what God desires for each and every one of us. And my prayer is that we might be a people who respond in obedience, that we might be a people who allow God to do this work of transformation in our lives, that we might with humility recognize that we aren't a people who have it all together. We can't make ourselves right with God, but God can, and God desires to do that in each and every one of us today. I want to conclude this morning with the same words in which we began our service from Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are so thankful for your word this morning. We are so thankful for this reminder that you desire so much more than outer appearances. You desire so much more than for your people to go through the right motions. You desire so much more than lip service. Rather, you are calling us to be a people who are all in. A people who humble ourselves before you. A people who allow you to come in and do the work of transformation in our lives that we need to be made pure and holy in your sight. 
God, we ask that you would do that in our hearts and lives this morning. And that as you are faithful to transform our hearts more and more into the image of Christ Jesus, our Lord, that we might bear the good fruits in our world of justice and mercy and faithfulness. That we might be a found a people who the inside and the outside look the same. That inside the purity and holiness of God living within us might bear good fruit that others might see you at work in the world as well. We are so thankful that you are a God who does not leave us where we are at. You are a God who does not turn your back on us. You do not give up on us. You do not say they are too unclean and impure. But rather you come to us and you desire nothing more than to cleanse us and to make us white as snow. And we are thankful for the promise, God. The promise and the blessing of being able to see you one day face to face. We long for and we anticipate that glorious day. And we thank you that that is the future we get to look forward to in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Church, receive this benediction. May you see the ways that God is at work in the world around you. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be held blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Go in the grace and the peace of God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.